So I come from a, a long line of storytellers, much like the people right in front of me. So there's a reason why you don't see me behind a microphone very often. Uh, but tonight I want to tell you a story, and I sort of want to marry that with a, a pet peeve. When I moved back to Memphis in 2010, I really had no idea what I was doing here. I came here for one reason, and that was to be closer to someone that I loved. Uh, some of you may know her. Um, but really, I had, I had no idea how much pressure I was going to end up putting on her just through the weight of my own insecurity. Uh, she worked in arts administration, she worked in music, and therefore she was gone all the time. And at least that's the only thing that I saw. Uh, but in, in reality, you know, she had a job that she loved, she worked with artists that she loved, and she was busy out living a life that sh she was really good at. Um, and the only thing that, you know, that I felt like I was good at was looking deep into my imagination and trying to pull what was inside out. Um, when we were together, you know, I would share these ideas with her and her eyes would light up and she would start spouting out ways that I could make those ideas real. Um, and she told me something that has forever shaped my approach to art and the way that I live. And that is that the most successful artists are those who can keep one foot in the imagination and one foot in reality. Um, trying to figure out what that meant to me has taken some time, and I began learning something about the nature of my ideas, which is that they come fairly easy, but once they filter down into my hands, like, well, then they become work. Um, and I think that's where a lot of artists, you know, I, I think that's where we mess up. You know, something could happen in our personal lives, which then kind of, you know, ripples out into missing a deadline or something like that. But I know a lot of art is about feelings, right? But what I'm talking about is that sort of surface level interaction where what we do meets the need of that person buying that thing from us. Uh, at the end of the day, if you are producing something for someone for an exchange of money, well, then you're a professional. One of the first steps that I took in trying to become more professional was uh, applying to an RFP back in 2010 from the Urban Art Commission, which took seven studio artists and taught them how to make murals. After completing my first one, my eyes were open to all of the potential buildings that are in our city. You know, we live in what's called a post-industrial area, which accounts for a lot of the giant warehouses that you see around us, which are mostly vacant. Uh, driving around town, I started calling uh, commercial real estate signs, looking for somebody that would let me paint one. And um, after a number of calls, I landed my first client. Uh, he's here tonight. This is my boy Pat. Love Pat. Okay, so I know that it was a God. I know that it was a God thing because it was just a week before that conversation, and I was just kind of thinking to myself, I was like, "Man, I wish somebody would just give me a big wall with no strings attached." Well, then I met Pat, and he practically screamed over the phone, "Like, I've been looking for somebody like you for ten years. I have a city block you can have." And um, we sort of figured out this mutual back scratching thing. And it was basically like, I wanted to get more murals under my belt. Pat needed exposure for his property. You know, and it, it just worked out that way. Well, next, a little bit further down the road, I, I met a dear friend of mine downtown who had just finished up orchestrating several murals down South Main. And I said, hey, what's, what's happening, you know, next? Like, what are some other areas of downtown? And she said... I, she said, I don't know, what do you think? And I said, well, what about the Steric building? And she was like, I, you have my attention. And so about four months later, the largest blighted property in the city was wrapped in artwork and being photographed and tweeted countless times. Um, I didn't do this by myself. So um, I noticed something working on this project. You know, people would stop, they'd see the artwork, they'd take a picture, and then they'd look up. And I can't tell you how many times I'd be telling someone with a smile on my face, excited about the property, and they would say, what are they, what are they doing with that building? And it got me asking myself, like, who are they? Like, is it the city? Is it the owner? Is it us? Like, you, you may not label yourself an artist, but creativity comes in many forms. And at the root of it is this ability to, like, visualize potential. Okay, so it's, it's, it's not about the artwork. It's never been about the artwork. I, d I don't consider this project to be done. Um, I have to remind myself that all the time. Like, it's not about me or my style. Get over yourself. That's the title of the talk. Like, get over yourself. It's about activating a space. It's about bringing a building back to life. Um, and my last point to that, this is kind of a pep talk for artists. It's not about the money. Like, it can never be about the money. You're an artist, <laughs> okay? Like... <laughs> Try to think of yourself as, um, as an opportunity for building a relationship and don't just see the dollar signs. My hope is that more people will drive downtown, they'll see the building, and they'll say, 
what are they doing with that building? And hopefully somebody with more money and some ideas will say, I've got an idea. So between now and then, uh, keep one foot in the imagination and one foot in the reality, okay? Thanks. Thank you.